Hey everyone, uh, this is lecture 6.2. Uh, this time we're talking about rape culture. Uh, so uh, we'll be talking about what exactly is rape culture. Uh, you'll note that in lecture 6.1, I did allude to this a couple times. I probably should have covered this first. Uh, and then we'll also talk about attempts to be better. In terms of content warnings, uh, again, we're continuing on some pretty heady uh, material. So um, structural sexism is absolutely something that will be present in this conversation. And we will also be talking about rape itself. So the difficulty in profiling rapists, as we alluded to earlier, suggests that the problem of rape is not necessarily a problem with individuals. It is certainly a problem that individuals do, but it is actually a problem of the structure of society itself. Most societies, including ours, do have a hidden culture of rape. That will be defined as norms, values, and artifacts that encourage rape and sexual assault. Uh, this is most commonly seen in portrayals of women as only objects of desire for men, as in they have been, become objects uh, for uh, men's male desire, or the male gaze, as it's sometimes called. Rape culture has absolutely improved in recent decades, but it is still very much part of our society. Uh, the artifact we're looking at here is um, a pen. Uh, these kinds of things were actually at one time quite common. Uh, when I was a little kid, uh, they were still kind of around, uh, but they weren't like left out for little kids to see. Basically that pen there, uh, if you would turn it upside down, uh, the uh, lady's bathing suit would come off of her and um, then you'd have a naked lady on your hands. Uh, this kind of thing could be found in pretty much any office, uh, and that novelty of that item, um, it, it says a lot. It really does. Uh, and additionally, we have this idea when we talk about rape culture uh, within our society and many other societies of what's known as the Madonna whore complex. Uh, this is the paradox that women are expected to be both highly sexual and also virginal and innocent, right? Uh, and we see this um, we see this in some uh, more uh, problematic of the cultural artifacts surrounding uh, gender and sexuality, especially gender and sexuality surrounding teenage girls, where they are encouraging encouraged to be both. Um, innocent, but also uh, sexual. Uh, this was really uh, personified, not saying it's the only time this has happened in culture, but definitely uh, surrounding the uh, Britney Spears album, Baby One More Time. There were a number of issues surrounding that album itself, including this cover art where um, she both looks like a little girl and also is portrayed as being uh, very sexual as well. Um, I don't know how you would interpret baby one more time, uh, especially with the song it, that goes hit me baby one more time, other than either being sexual or in some way abusive. Uh, so additional uh, elements of rape culture include violent and non-consensual pornography, especially uh, so-called revenge porn that is put on the internet without the consent of the person that is, is being depicted there. Uh, that is, it's, it's deeply problematic. Uh, there are attempts to uh, make those kinds of things uh, criminal, but unfortunately in some places, uh, revenge porn is not uh, a criminal offense, even though it's very, very unethical. Um, our cultural understandings influence how we imagine rape actually occurs. And this is also an element of rape culture. So it includes our biases. Who do we think are the people perpetrating the rape? What does a rapist look like? What does a rape victim actually look like, right? Uh, who um, who rapes who? Uh, so we're talking about homophobic attitudes as well often. Uh, all of these um, create kind of a narrative of what a rape looks like and 
many of those conceptions there are um, highly stereotypical at best. Um, there are definitely consequences of rape culture. It is part of our society, is something that exists with us whether we like it or not. Uh, first of all, rape culture normalizes sexual violence. They can, this can cause us to not recognize rape and sexual assault when we actually see it. Um, I will never forget, I was showing a, um, a film in one of my classes and it, it was completely unrelated to sexual assault. But there was a scene where a, a man was, um, he was, he was, you could say getting handsy, right? He was, he was trying to initiate uh, sexual contact without the consent of the individual. And it, it really, it, it was from like the 1950s or so. And it really didn't quite look like what you think of as rape. And most of the room, people in the class didn't perceive that as being rape. But somebody who had been a victim of sexual assault absolutely was traumatized by those images and talked to me about it later. And when you look at it again, this scene, after you see it, it's like, oh yeah, that absolutely, that, that is non, that's sexual assault happening there. Um, and those, those kinds of things are present in a lot of our media, um, especially if you look at like comedy movies from the 70s and 80s, a lot of that stuff includes just straight up sexual assault as a joke. Um, I did, so uh, what we do there then is it creates the vicious cycle of what is and is not okay in terms of uh, sexual behavior. And then it makes women and other people feel unsafe in situate in uh, potentially romantic situations or other situations. And then that can lead men to feel confused about what is and is not okay. Now, given obviously uh, the greater trauma is put on uh, women in that situation, but uh, the, the male confusion component of that then uh, could um, lead to contributing to uh, rapists not uh, not incidental rapists and incidental assaulters to not really recognize and realize the, the really horrible damage that they're actually doing, even if it is accidental. So all of this conversation leads us to, well, what have people done to try to actually be better? Uh, as mentioned previously, college campuses uh, used to be very, very bad in terms of ignoring issues surrounding sexual assault. Uh, this issue uh, started to get real attention in the late 1990s, uh, keeping in mind that most modern colleges, uh, well, many well, uh, uh, older colleges, I guess, uh, in the United States that were founded, say, the 1880s or so, they had about 120 years to get better, and they didn't. Uh, so it was about 100 years after most colleges were founded that they started to think, hmm, maybe we need to make our our campus a place where sex, sexual assault is not common, which is deeply problematic. Uh, unfortunately, many of the social engineering policies of the 1990s had a tendency to be both heavy handed and somehow weak. Uh, you really see this in the 90s with a lot of uh, what we now call social justice issues, uh, things surrounding sexuality, things surrounding race and ethnicity, etc. People were trying to be better, uh, but a lot of those attempts to be better uh, really uh, fell short in a lot of ways. One such concept, and this is just an example, this wasn't the only thing done, uh, was the concept of a, quote, rape-free campus, which fundamentally, the concept is amazing. But um, what it took to become a so-called rape-free campus uh, would require each of the following. To have a culture that both reflects and contributes to sexual equality between sexes and sexual orientations. Well, okay, that's that's something that uh, in the modern era we are all striving for. That looks good. To abolish heavy drinking. We've seen in the past in our country what happens when you try to dictate 
uh, how much of any substance people put in their bodies, it usually doesn't go very well, right? So to talk about abolition of a behavior uh, that is not inherently criminal um, or that most people do not think is bad, that is a big red flag right there. Uh, many people uh, often uh, point out or they like to argue that you can't even, you, that's impossible to do on a college campus to abolish heavy drinking. I don't know if I buy the impossible component of that, uh, but I will say it's, it's pretty unlikely. Uh, additionally, uh, direct immediate punishment at the institutional level of sexual assaults. That looks pretty good actually. Uh, so um, an, el an element there uh, surrounding sexual assaults in the previous era was that when rapes would occur, uh, the, the rapist would get a very, very minimal punishment, uh, something like academic probation for, for raping a woman and permanently psychologically scarring them. Uh, so what we're arguing here is that uh, these people need to be punished on the institutional level. And then also going into the next one, evidence of sexual assaults are then turned over to law enforcement. That again, very real thing, uh, would actually be very helpful. Uh, however, uh, collecting of that evidence in a legally binding way is often uh, not possible by kind of basic human dynamics behavior. Uh, rape victims want to, uh, they're afraid, they want to hide. Uh, it's, it's almost a sociobiological um, drive, if you will, uh, and that we're encouraged by our society to kind of be that way as well. Uh, so really, in the rape-free uh, campus concept, um, all of them look pretty good, uh, except uh, abolish heavy drinking. Uh, I think a better phraseology could maybe be, maybe be discourage heavy drinking, um, phase out heavy drinking culturally to where um, to make it safe, if you will. Um, but yes, it's a problem. Another clumsy idea, which is somehow clumsier than the concept of the rape-free campus, which again, I would love a campus to be rape-free, uh, is the Antioch policy. Uh, this uh, was a very specific policy put into place uh, at Antioch College uh, here in Ohio that required uh, each new level of intimacy to be verbally consented to by a partner in every session of sexual interaction. And thus, without this consent, every new level was considered forced. Um, this this is, is a, a, a hard one. It does sound kind of on its surface to be something that would work out. However, when you put policies into place dictating how exactly uh, people should um, communicate with each other in a sexual way, it is often more than verbal. And additionally, while we as a society could maybe move toward giving more verbal cues sexually, um, it is... Um, it, it leads to trivializing it, people not taking it seriously. When you put up a lot of rules surrounding sex on the institutional level, people almost inherently roll their eyes, right? So for you sociology nerds out there, uh, such a policy has a tendency to initiate problems as Weber identified with bureaucracies. So if you remember that material from Social 101, this is a conflict between the ideal type and the real type where um, people don't like following rules. Well, if people don't, don't follow rules and there are specific rules surrounding sexuality, it may actually encourage uh, really uh, negative, dangerous sexual situations as opposed to trying to discourage those situations. Okay, that is the end of it for this lecture. If there are any questions on anything, please just let me know.